conceptual perspectives people talk Real about talk, it, it throwing shots. all of the elements. Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. everybody is having a great start to your week uh, I'm not going to be long but I just want to talk to you about something that's on my mind uh, as you know as you saw in the intro uh, we're definitely still in the middle of a fundraiser and we are uh, encouraging you to support the work we do um, so look in the description box there are several different ways that you can contribute find the way that works to you for you the process that works for you and support the work we do we need to accomplish some great things this year and we're going to need your help to do it so with that being said i'm going to move on i was contacted after the uh, video was released of the beating of Tyree Nichols. I was contacted by Kelly Lawson, who is the founder and host of the Sunrise Project, which is uh, an own uh, network podcast. Uh, Kelly is also uh, a client uh, that has worked with me in the past, uh, her and her son. And I'm a resident expert on trauma uh, and healing and so she asked me if I would uh, come on I'm not scheduled to be on there until uh, the 11th of February but she asked me if I would come on and so we're doing a two week uh, special uh, interactive talk session that basically I'm filling the questions and talking about the multiplicity of uh, forces in the dynamic at play with this particular situation and why it has such a massive reach and impact in the black community and uh, with others as well. And so I was on, on yesterday and I'll be back on again next Sunday. And I just wanted to kind of talk about some things that, that came up that I think is extremely important. I think that when we see something like that we see it and we don't really think outside of the scope of what we're experiencing at the moment so it becomes this poor kid this poor family and what we don't realize especially for blacks who have gone through this perpetual experience of oppression violence um, marginalization and so much more that we relate to it when we see it happening to someone else. We literally have a, what we call a vicarious experience. And so what we don't see is the trauma that happens outside of the spectrum of that person being harmed or killed and how their family may feel. But there are people who are literally developing paradigms and ideas around how they exist in this world as a black person based off the things that they're being constantly fed. Uh, and so what we need to be aware of is 
we need to first and foremost guard our mental health and guard our peace. Um, I didn't watch the video. I haven't watched a police brutality video of a black man being killed in years. I want to say five years uh, that I haven't watched it. And I just made a decision that because of what I do, I'm constantly getting this content. I'm constantly getting it. People want my opinion. People want to interview me. People want help uh, providing grief counseling and a bunch of other things that we do. And they want me to look at it. And, and, and at a point, I'm realizing I'm getting flooded and it's messing with my soul. It's messing with my mental health. It's messing with my emotional health. It's not good. You have to understand that you're consuming things, that when you take things in your gate, you're consuming them through your ears and through your eyes predominantly, uh, but also through the sense of smell. And what you have to understand is there's no such thing as untouched unless you are a psychopath or an extreme sociopath there's no such thing as it doesn't bother me it's a desensitization process a coping mechanism but it's definitely changing the norms and standards and your balance of what's real what's acceptable it's re-socializing you into the acceptance of violence and into the willingness to per per perpetuate violence at some point. It's a part of the desensitization process. What it's also doing is for those people who are sensitive to the violence, sensitive to the experience, it's traumatizing them. For someone who it's happened to before, someone who knows someone it happens to before, they are just been re-injured. For somebody who really has a concern about humanity, they've been injured. And this is a vicarious experience that produces real results. In other words, this idea that because it's not me, it shouldn't bother me sounds good and it's it's macho, but it does not reflect our natural uh, dynamic mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually of how we consume, how we process, and how we experience things. So when this happened, the reason you see such an outpouring of looking at this is there are a bunch of us that are looking at it and said it could have been my son or as a black man it could have been me and you look at that part of it then you look at the type of hatred it takes to dispense that much damage and devastation towards one person then you process the fact that it was done by other blacks and then if you are really aware and astute and understand how things work, you realize this is beyond hatred. This is literally institutionally sanctioned violence because it comes out of a culture that permits it and literally through policy defends and protects it. And so you look at it and you, you start to process it and you start to realize that if we're gonna be honest with ourselves, we still have not carved out a space for ourselves in this nation. And it comes with an emotional price because everybody wants to feel safe. Everybody wants to feel like they belong. Everybody wants to feel like they can, if necessary, defend themselves. And you, you're looking at that. And while I haven't watched the video, I've talked to enough people. Uh, you want to know how I know it was bad? I have people, I, I, I know a lot of police officers uh, because I've dealt with a lot of stuff and I help a lot of kids. Uh, I also have uh, police officers who are part of uh, my cigar fraternity and a bunch of other things. So uh, I get to talk to them. And normally that's usually this conversation when I bring it up or they bring it up. That's usually this conversation where they're trying to give me the perspective of what the cop may have been thinking when they shot this black man. Our black woman because they killed a number of our sisters as well you want to know how i knew it was bad not one of those cops defended it not one of those cops said well this may have happened or that every last one says the worst thing i've ever seen in my life and that alone said man it must be horrible then i started to get perspectives of what went down and how it happened and how it was prolonged and all of the incompetence that was at play and you look at it and say okay this is uh, something that kids are watching because everybody's got a device now and there are no ways to stop it that's why i'm really 
really pushing that we control our screen time, that we really become guardians of our gates, that we start to understand that what we consume impacts us. There's no such thing as just entertainment. There's no such thing as just news. There's no such thing. The stimuli you experience becomes a part of your reality. It impacts you. There's no way around it. That's why propaganda works. That's why advertising works. That's why marketing works because it impacts your ability to think your inability to make decisions, your ability to feel. It moves on your emotions. It's so many different angles being attacked at the same time. I don't care how good you are. You sit up and say, well, I can listen to it and I can say it's not real and I can sit up. No, your subconscious is being programmed and you are none the wiser of it because, as a matter of fact, the people, the, easy, the, people who e the people easiest to program are the ones that believe they can't be programmed. It's amazing. Uh, I've seen studies. I've, I've watched it happen. People who think they can't be affected by what's in the media are the ones most affected. And then the opinions that they're actually giving to back up their position are present opinions that they've actually been given, but they don't know it. Uh, it's, a, it's amazing. But when I think about this young man and what he had to go through, this mother who's had to bury her son. And I, I, I'm looking at this. The sadness of it is, this isn't the first time. Long before this, there was Mamie Till. Long before that, there were so many others who experienced this thing, this thing that keeps happening. And we seem to be at a loss for what to do about it. Uh, I'm going to give you a simple suggestion. It has worked for me in my life. It doesn't always and has not always made me popular or liked, but it has been the most effective tool to protecting me and my family. And that is anything that you don't desire someone doing to you, apply a negative consequence to it. Let me explain something. A protest is not a consequence. It's a warning. A protest without power, without the ability to carry out something that will bring discomfort, pain, or disruption to those who you are protesting against amounts to nothing but a collective temper tantrum. A protest does not become effective until there's something that can possibly follow the protest that can be viewed as a consequence of not uh, answering the concerns of those who protested. And as long as we remain in a position of powerlessness, our protests don't matter. What we write on social media doesn't matter. What we sit up and do in our neighborhoods when we storm the streets has no real true bearing on the outcome of what we are concerned about. What we are going to have to start doing is adding consequence to volatile situations in our community. And that doesn't just apply to police officers. It should apply to anybody who's causing harm to someone who isn't harming them. We need to protect our elderly, our women, our children, and our men, we need to do it. We need to make sure our women are safe at all times. We need to have a code of conduct. We need to have a set of protocols that sit up and say, this is what we do if you do this. Nobody is exempt. If you come in and you violate these, this is the consequences. Until we apply consequence, to actions that we do not deem acceptable, we will be overlooked, we will be ignored, and we will continue to be the target of violence. That it's policy driven. This is institutional racism at its finest. Racism isn't the act of bigotry. Racism is the act of an institutionalized culture, an institutionalized policy, in a way that it literally has created an environment where we can expect certain things to happen. Racism becomes a force when a person has the power to act on their bigotry or literally operates within the violence where the rules 
simply set up the behaviors that allow it. So a person will sit up and say, and this has been said, well, we can't say it was racist this time. Yes, we absolutely can say it was racist. Uh, Neely Fuller Jr. once said that until you truly understand white supremacy, uh, uh, until you truly understand white racism, uh, white supremacy racism, everything you think, how it works, how it impacts you and all of that, everything you think you understand will only confuse you. And here's the thing. We tend to think of racism as being an act of bigotry. So when someone calls us the N-word, when someone... Uh, yells and screams and cusses as us solely because we're black. We see that as racism. That's bigotry. That's a form of hatred based on ethnicity and race and, 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 and religion and a bunch of other things that can a person can be classified as. Racism is a systemic institutional thing that's governed by those who put the institution in place. It's a caste system that benefits one group while maligning another. It's a caste that gives privilege to one group while robbing another group of privilege and process and access. And so you can see it in policies, you can see it in laws, you can see it in corporate structures. It's simply a policy of practicing something. So it doesn't matter who executes the policy. If the policy is a racist policy, it's still racism. Just because five black cops beat this kid to death doesn't mean that racism isn't involved. The entire policing system is a racial caste system. It's a racial construct. It is predominantly predominant in its racial forces, racial policies, racial policing. We don't get protect and serve in the black community. We get policed. Two totally different things. It's policy. Who gets pulled over? And the frequency they get pulled over in one community versus another community is policy. It's something that's spoken about in the dispatch, uh, excuse me, in the brief rooms before they go out on their shifts. It's something that's set down and talked about from the top down and then spoken about on the bottom levels by supervisors. It is to be carried out. I'm going to pull this person over, even though they've done nothing to be pulled over. That was something else that came out in this is that uh, the report was falsified. Uh, there was no reason to pull him over. He was pulled over for suspicion of reckless driving. So he wasn't even pulled over for reckless driving. He's pulling over for suspicion of reckless driving. Now, this is a terminology used, an ambiguous terminology used to cover both ends. It's some old folks say you're talking about both ends, talking about both ends. It, it, it's basically, we're going to say it. We can't say reckless driving because then they're going to know proof of what the person did that constituted reckless driving and it should be on the dash cam it be some way or something that you can sit up and validate and with cameras everywhere nowadays it's hard to lie about something like that because it's going to be something that shows it so or shows that it didn't happen and so what they say is suspicion so th that was a suspicion that he drove reckless so we're going to pull him over now, what that tells me is that there was some reason other than a legitimate reason to pull him over. So they came up with that because if there was a legitimate reason to pull him over, the legitimate reason would be stated. It would be said, OK, this is what happened. Not that a legitimate reason to pull him over would still justify what happened. There is no justification for what happened. I've had cops who seen this video again. I refuse to watch it. Who has told who have told me this is the worst case of police brutality that they've ever seen in their life and some of them were alive during Rodney King and that's where most of them who were alive compared to say if it's anything worse it would have to be Rodney King you know but the thing is Rodney didn't die from the beating but Rodney was beaten brutally over and over and over again and this kid met the same fate but had a much, much worse outcome. And so there are all of these different valuables, I mean variables, that we are forced to face as a collective. And what we don't uh, like to admit, we, we do everything we can to disassociate ourselves with our blackness because with that blackness comes all of these challenges, all of these feelings, all of these frustrations, all of these difficulties. And so, but what we, what, what we can't shake is that no other racial group 
is conditioned to relate to one another and be connected to one another in the way that we are. Uh, I gave an example yesterday. I, I grew up born in the 60s, grew up as a kid in the 70s, came into my own as a teenager in high school and college in the 80s. And, 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 and so I grew up in a house with my great grandparents. They watched the news religiously. And I can remember so many times as a kid growing up and um, the news comes on and there's this story about somebody who's done something horrific, somebody who's done something uh, horrible and they haven't shown the face of the suspect or the offender yet. And I can hear my mom, my grandmother over and over again going, God, please don't let this be a black man. And you could look at the total devastation on her face when it was a black man. Why? Because we take on all of the uh, behaviors and the situations. We see and know that we are going to be judged by what someone who we don't even know does. We're going to be looked at at work when we get to work the next day if it was a big enough story. And, and so we carry this self-consciousness of what's going on. And this is one of the reasons why we feel the need to qualify our victims. And I want to impress upon you and encourage you to stop doing that. And what I mean by qualifying our victims is when something happens to one of ours, we want to talk about uh, them being an A student, never being in trouble, having done this, was a part of this, was the, and what we're doing is we're qualifying them. We're saying because of all of this, you shouldn't, no, unless your life was threatened, unless they gave you a legitimate reason that would be considered legitimate if they were white for you to kill them, it doesn't matter what their record says. Unless they've just killed somebody and they are on the move and in, in the, the bulletin says armed and dangerous and there's this and then, OK, it's it's a little different. But I've seen white men walk out of buildings after having shot tens of people and still be taken alive. So it amazes me when an unarmed person black man who hasn't harmed anyone is killed it doesn't matter to me what color the person is that killed him what matters to me is the person that killed him is sworn to protect him we can't keep living our lives in environments where the people we should be able to depend on the protectors are harming us. And that goes for the men that our women get with who harm them. That goes for all the people and men in the community. That goes for all the women that are preying on other women like Shaquella. You know, we, 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 we got so much of this trauma flowing through our lives that we can't manage it. And... My thing is we're going to have to start managing it by guarding our gates. We can't keep consuming this. I know we want to know what happens, but it comes at a heavy price. And I don't think we really get the devastation that we're uh, wreaking and havoc we're wreaking on our neurological system. We are really, really causing a great deal of damage. Um, I can't tell you how healthier I've been since I've stopped and it's constantly being being able to monitor what am I consuming that I don't have to that's having a negative impact on me well obviously because I'm a counselor a therapist and a life coach I'm getting everybody's stuff so that stuff I've, if I'm going to help you I need to know but going out just looking at snuff snuff videos uh trauma porn I, I, I'm good on that and I, I suggest that you take a position to protect your health and your peace. Um, also, we need to get behind programs that help us heal. Uh, I've talked to you about the programs we offer. We'll continue to do them. We're looking to expand even more this year. Um, we need to do a better job of preparing our children for what's out there. Here's the sad thing, and then I'm going to shut it down on this. Here's the sad thing about this. When you look at George Floyd, when you look at um, 
Tyree Nichols, when you look at Oscar Grant, when you look at uh, all these different people, uh, especially the ones that didn't do anything. That w Oscar Grant was trying to defuse a fight. Um, um, my little man in Cleveland, I don't know why. Uh, he normally is always the top of my, I think because his name is kind of close to Tyree's, my, 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 I won't pull him up. Uh, but he's sitting there playing at a park with a toy gun. Um, and I'm pretty sure before it's over, it'll pop in my head. But just over and over again, what happens when everything you tell your kid to do, they do, and they still end up dead? That's the hard one because now you're saying there's nothing I can do to protect my child. The thing, the one thing that I have an ultimate ob obligation to do, I can't be sure I can do it because there's going to be a time when they're going to be out there and I won't be there. So then the question becomes, at what point do we make it costly? That's the question I'm going to leave you with. Tamir Rice. I told you it would come to me. Tamir Rice. Uh, at what point are we going to make it costly to harm us? That's the question I'm going to leave you with. Again, if you believe in the work we're doing in the community, uh, go to the description box, click the link, and give. Uh, the work we do in research, the work we do in program development, implementation, facilitation, uh, wraparound services like mental health services, uh, counseling, all that stuff costs. We've been doing it for decades. We're asking you to join in and help. We've got a lot of work to do on so many different fronts. And we can't do it if we don't stand together, if we don't unify, if we don't come together and act in a unified manner. Uh, J. J. Edgar Hoover, when asked in the late 60s, the greatest threat to national security, his response was black unity. And if you look at COINTELPRO and the other things that Hoover was behind that disrupted black progress, his whole point was to disrupt unity then that tells me that's what we should be seeking. We're going to have to put our differences aside. We're going to have to find a way to love ourselves again because in loving ourselves, we can love one another. If we can love one another, then we become passionate about protecting the thing that we value and that love because until we get to that point, we can't demand someone else value something that we're not showing enough interest and value in ourselves. On that note, I'm out of here. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day. Thank you.